We interrupt this broadcast for some shameless self-promotion. In a short time, you will be hearing from the learned Ryan Stitt, informing you all about the ancient Greek attitudes about burial and cremation. Ah, nothing like some char-grilled Athenian. But before then, I have blackmailed Ryan to take some airtime on his own show, which he has reluctantly permitted me. So his problematic days of espionage will remain a secret. Anyway, my name is Dr. Foxweed. I was a professor, a war criminal, and a snake milker. But in my old age, I am now a hack with the YouTube History channel. Do look it up if you are interested in ancient history, which is my main focus. If you want to learn about the early days of Athens before democracy, a grim period of tyrant conspiracies, clan feuds, and debt slaves, look no further. Equally, if you are curious about the heady days of early Christianity, I have some strange stories to tell of heresies and starving monks. We'll also be looking at other subjects later on too, like the Roman Republic and the Achaemenid Persians. So yes, do look up Foxweed History on YouTube if you are curious about any of these things. The weed is spelt W-E-D-E. -E. Now, uh, do join Ryan in his intriguing exploration of the tombs and graveyards of the ancient Greek world to understand their utterly fascinating views on death. Farewell. Hello, I'm Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 79, Old Age, Death, and Burial. Growing old in the Greek world was certainly not for the faint-hearted, any more than it is today. As an elderly Greek, it's quite likely that you would have been short-sighted and deaf, and you might have collected a few broken bones in your lifetime that had never been properly set. On the bright side, though, you probably didn't have to look forward to a period of increasing and prolonged debilitation at the end of your life. Chances are that you would have been fairly active until your final illness, although possibly in extreme discomfort, as we shall see. The list of Greeks who remained productive and energetic in old age is impressive, though, as demonstrated by the recorded ages of the rhetoricians Gorgias, 108, and Isocrates, 98, the tragic poet Sophocles, 90, and Euripides, 80, the philosopher Plato, 81, and three of the seven sages of archaic Greece, among others. Even if some of these individuals exaggerated their ages for effect, or were gratuitously assigned long lives later, that in itself tells us a great deal about the conception of old age in Greece, that being old was nothing to be ashamed of. On the contrary, longevity seems to have been regarded as a sign of wisdom and exceptional intelligence, and therefore something in which the Greeks took considerable pride. One of the reasons for this attitude was that there were so few elderly people in Greece. Life expectancy now runs at about 80 for females and 75 for males in some countries. But in antiquity, a much smaller percentage of the population survived into their 50s, let alone their 60s, 70s, or 80s, than they do today. In fact, as we discussed in episode 77, estimates place the median age at death to 35 for women and 45 for men. Still though, a reverence for old age wasn't something that was universally held, as it is often described as hateful in Greek literature, and it seems clear that the average non-elite Greek probably looked forward to it with some degree of apprehension. As has been the case for every period of human history, One's chances for surviving into old age in the ancient world depended greatly on one's social and economic status. Those who were wealthy and led sedentary lives, including the aforementioned philosophers and poets, were much more likely to survive into a ripe old age in a better condition. 
It's also likely that the elderly in ancient Greece would have needed a tough constitution and good genes and needed to be psychologically resilient. Those who reached old age probably faced many more psychological challenges and hardships than the average person does in the modern developed world today. In particular, there was a good chance that they would have outlived some of their children, and perhaps even some of their grandchildren, and might well have faced the death of a spouse at an early age, either through death in childbirth, warfare, or to diseases. Though there were upper age limits for men who took on certain official roles, the concept of retirement was essentially foreign in the ancient world. We have no means of knowing what percentage of the Greek population was able to retire, nor is there any way of estimating to what extent the Greeks regarded retirement as an attractive or even possible option to aspire for. Probably, most working Greeks soldiered on, doing what they could, and the majority of elderly Greeks probably remained relatively physically fit and mentally alert until their final illness and death. Few households would have had the time, energy, or resources to attend to those who were either incapacitated or bedridden. Even the aged would have expected to play some part, however small, in the family's economic well-being. For example, Odysseus' father, Laertes, who makes himself useful by working in the vineyard on his own farm, is likely to have been typical. Similarly, in Athens, although we occasionally hear of the head of the household handing over the management of his property legally to his son, we do not know how common this was. In regards to infirm slaves, while those who worked domestically, such as nurses and pedagogues, would probably have been treated humanely in their declining years, the prospects for those who did not have a personal relationship with their masters must have been grim indeed. Service in the citizen militias of Greece, down to the time of Alexander the Great, did not end until a man reached the age of 60. Up until then, elderly men served as reservists, on call if the city came under attack. Ordinarily, elderly citizens did not receive a pension from the state. In Athens, the only people who received state support in old age were the parents of sons who had died in war, and women who had given birth to sons after their husbands had died, typically because of warfare, but also for other reasons. Elderly men could earn a modest income from jury service, but it was only just enough to scrape by. No Greek writer, whom we know of though, ever concerned himself with the economic plight of the elderly. This may be explained by the fact that writers belonged to the privileged class and didn't have to bother about such things. There were also no public facilities for the elderly, and the very idea of an old people's home would have been utterly detestable to most Greeks, as they regarded the care of the elderly as a sacred duty. They called this gerobaskia, literally the nourishing, or bosco, of the elderly, or gereos, from where we get the English word geriatrics. The responsibility for such elderly care rested exclusively with the offspring, and Greek law laid down severe penalties for those who failed to carry out this obligation. In Delphi, for example, any son who failed to look after his parents was liable to be thrown into prison, and in Athens, those who neglected either his parents or his grandparents were fined and partially deprived of his citizen rights. Only those who hadn't learned basic skills to make a living or had been prostituted by their parents were released from this solemn and binding obligation, essentially because the parents had deprived them of possessing the skills and or ability to be an Athenian citizen. Furthermore, in Athens, if a man didn't have any sons to look after him, either because they had all died or he was just childless, it was customary for him to adopt a male heir of adult age to whom he would bequeath his whole estate. In return, the adopted son would look after him in old age, give him a proper burial, and pay regular visits to his tomb. The adopted son, though, would lose all legal connection with the family into which he had been born, including the right to inherit, in order to make him ineligible to inherit more than one estate. In this way, if he had an heir himself, he would prevent his adoptive father's household from dying out. To a limited degree, this arrangement may have served to redistribute wealth, because the majority of adopted sons would have been unlikely to have relinquished their inheritance from their natal homes unless they were guaranteed an improvement in their financial prospects from their new homes. Adoption thus was as much a practical as well as a sentimental arrangement, into which both parties entered into with a firm calculation of their own advantages gained. <laughs>
We don't know of any Greek women who lived to such a great age, but that could have just been because of the general disinterest by the sources and women who were beyond childbearing age. But they too were entitled to support from their sons. As we discussed in episode 74, wealthy women who became widowed often returned to their original families, taking their dowries with them so that they wouldn't be destitute. The situation of those women who didn't have a dowry to reclaim or didn't have any sons to support them was extremely precarious, though. Once their husbands died, they were not allowed to adopt. Such women could work, but their career choices were severely limited. Women over the age of 60 were permitted to act as mourners at the funerals of those to whom they were not closely related, and they probably earned a pittance for these services. Other aging women served as midwives. Elderly unmarried women who had nothing to fall back on might continue their earlier occupations until they were no longer capable of work. At that point, there was probably no alternative but to become a beggar. Although the elderly were esteemed in the ancient world, we shouldn't assume that this view was simplistic or clear-cut either. Like us, the Greeks had stereotypical models of old age. One of the most memorable literary portraits of old age in Greek literature comes to us in the Iliad, of the elderly Nestor, the king of Pylos. Homer portrays Nestor as garrulous, long-winded, prone to lapsing into lengthy recollections of the past, not averse to singing his own praises, and rather critical of the younger generation, which goes to show that the anti-millennials type of rhetoric by previous generations isn't anything new. In doing so, Nestor claims to have seen two generations pass away and is now ruling over the third and delivers lengthy diatribes about the superiority of the men of his generation to those of the present day. Harkening back to a supposedly golden age when youths were inherently deferential to their elders, Nestor remarks that in former times he associated with better warriors who never made light of him. And so, even though Homer's portrait is by no means devoid of affection and respect for Nestor, he seems to have been concerned about the degree of respect that the elderly received from the younger generation, possibly a reflection on his own times when the poem was composed in the archaic period. However, this degree of respect varied considerably from one Greek community to another, and there are other stereotypical portraits of the elderly in Greek literature that are less affectionately drawn. In Attic comedy, for example, the elderly are often caricatured as irritable, grouchy, and abusive. A notable example is Philocleon, who appears in Aristophanes' Wasps, as a retiree who looks back wistfully on his youth with all of the venom of a frustrated old age. The cruelest of these, though, are the portraits of elderly women, in which Aristophanes consistently portrays them as being less than deplorable in their yearning for sexual attention. Although the Athenians were required by law to look after their parents, mistreatment of the elderly seems to have been commonplace in the late 5th century BC, or at least it became a matter of public concern. For example, we're told by Plutarch that the tragic poet Sophocles was dragged into court by his own sons at the age of 90 on the charge that he was mentally incompetent and incapable of managing his own financial affairs. He did this in order to gain the guardianship of his father's fortune, accusing him of paranoia, which in this context translates as something akin to Alzheimer's disease. Sophocles is said to have refuted his charge by reading the chorus from his play titled Oedipus at Colonus, which he was currently writing. He then turned to the jury and inquired, quote, Do you consider that to be the work of an idiot? End quote. This proved to the court that he was still in possession of all of his mental faculties, and so he was acquitted. Classical Athens' mistreatment of the elderly, almost to the point of taking advantage of them, was in marked contrast to Sparta where old people were held in the highest esteem, much like what Nestor opines about during his so-called golden age. This difference in attitude is in part a reflection of the conservative temperament of the Spartan people. In Xenophon's Memoirs of Socrates, Pericles despairingly demands, quote, When will the Athenians respect their elders in the same way that the Spartans respect theirs, instead of despising everyone older than themselves, beginning with their own fathers? End quote. According to Herodotus, it was a characteristic of Spartan youths to stand aside for their elders when they passed them in the street and to rise when they entered the room. No such customs are recorded for Athens, a much more youth-oriented culture. 
Greek physicians, though, do not seem to have been much concerned with the welfare of the elderly, as there is very little discussion of their ailments in medical treatises, and even less about how to treat them, which we discussed last episode. This was no doubt due to professional helplessness in the face of the degenerative process, brought on by aging and chronic illnesses. Given the absence of effective painkillers, many old people who ultimately succumb to a disease must have ended their days in extreme discomfort. In the Hippocratic treatise titled Aphorisms, the author catalogs the ills that the elderly might have been subjected to. Quote, Difficulty in breathing, excessive mucus in the nose or throat accompanied by coughing, problems of the urinary tract, arthritis, kidney failure, dizzy spells, apoplexia, cachexia, itching of the whole body, insomnia, watery discharge from the bowels, eyes and nostrils, dullness of vision, glaucoma, and deafness, end quote. It is unlikely, though, that many of the elderly would have sought to take their own lives in order to end their misery, in view of the fact that suicides were thought to have constituted an unhappy category of the dead in the underworld, which we discussed in episode 60. Only among the Stoic philosophers, which grew in popularity during the Hellenistic and Roman periods, was it regarded as a point of honor for the very age to terminate their existence before entering upon their dotage. And now, let us take a short break for a word from our sponsors. The History of Ancient Greece is sponsored by the CLNS Media Network, and today's episode is brought to you by RX Bar. RX Bar is a whole food protein bar made with real, whole ingredients. Believing in the power of transparency, its core ingredients are all listed on the front of the packaging. You'd likely recognize RX Bar at the shelf. They're the ones who have egg whites or protein that is easy for your body to absorb, dates for binding, nuts for texture, and other delicious ingredients like unsweetened chocolate, real fruit, and spices like sea salt or cinnamon. It turns out that you don't need the artificial flavors, fillers, the additives, the chemicals, or the added sugar to actually taste really good. RX bars are gluten-free, soy-free, and dairy-free. Whether you like sweet or savory, chocolate or fruit flavors, there's definitely an RX bar for you in 14 delicious flavor varieties. Mango pineapple, chocolate hazelnut, peanut butter and berries, chocolate sea salt, coconut chocolate, mixed berry, blueberry, maple sea salt, apple cinnamon, mint chocolate, chocolate chip, peanut butter, peanut butter chocolate, and coffee chocolate, and seasonal flavors too. RX bars are great for a number of occasions, like breakfast on the go, a snack at the office to push you through your 3 p.m. slump, to throw in your bag for a plane ride, to toss in your backpack for a bike ride or hike, and for a pre- or post-workout snack. I've personally used RX bars for breakfast when I'm running late and before workouts because their wholesome ingredients quench your appetite and give you that extra kick of energy your body needs to push it to the limit. What are you waiting for? Try RX bar today. For 25% off your first order, visit rxbar.com slash thoag and enter promo code thoag at checkout. Again, that's rxbar.com and enter the promo code THOAG at checkout. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. When the elderly, as well as everyone else, passed away, their bodies were treated with reverence, and ancient Greek funerary practices are attested widely in literature, the archaeological record, and art. Finds associated with burials are an important source for ancient Greek culture, though Greek funerals are not as well documented as those of the ancient Romans. The Greeks typically buried their dead in individual graves, rather than group tombs. Athens, though, was a major exception, as the Athenians normally cremated their dead and placed their ashes in an urn. During the early Archaic period, Greek cemeteries became larger, but grave goods decreased. This greater simplicity in burials coincided with the rise of democracy and the egalitarian military of the hoplite phalanx, and became more pronounced during the early Classical period. During the 4th century BC, the decline of democracy and the return of aristocratic dominance was accompanied by more magnificent tombs that announced the occupant's status, most notably the vaulted tombs of the Macedonians, with painted walls and rich grave goods, the best example of which is the tomb at Vergina, thought to belong to Philip II of Macedon, though that'll be discussed in a future episode. <laughs> 
we have a number of cemeteries from archaic and classical Greece, and specifically from around the city of Athens and throughout Attica. They aren't always well published and fully excavated though, so as always, one of the things we have to think about are the sorts of limitations we have on the evidence and the kinds of qualifiers that we have to put in place. That is particularly true in Athens itself, since it is a modern city that has been built right on top of the ancient city, making it a bit difficult to excavate the entire city. And so some areas are well excavated, while other areas are mainly known because of rescue excavations, which often came about as a discovery when some piece of building work was being done. This makes it difficult to understand what the city was like in full. One of the areas of Athens that is well excavated, though, is the Karamikos, or the Potter's Quarter. Excavations there have been ongoing for almost 150 years, since 1870, and are presently overseen by the German Archaeological Institute of Athens, as they have done so since 1913. Although the area has undergone a number of archaeological excavations in recent years, the excavated area covers only a small portion of the ancient deem. Large areas adjacent to those already excavated remain to be explored, as they lie under the fabric of modern-day Athens, and expropriation of these areas has been delayed until funding is secure. The finds from the excavations are housed on site in the Karamikos Archaeological Museum. Many of the artifacts found in the Karamikos are funerary or otherwise death-related, and reflect the Athenian attitudes towards the afterlife. And so many of the sculptures exhibited here are urns, lekithoi, grave reliefs, stelae, jewelry, and so forth. Although we use the term Karamikos to refer to the ancient cemetery of Athens, in antiquity the Karamikos was a deme, as a sort of suburb of Athens that initially laid outside the city. It was located on the northwestern edge of the city of Athens, and the site attracted many tombs. The Greeks had no conception of a necropolis in the literal meaning of the word, though of course necropolis is a Greek word, a city for the dead that is separate from the living. Those who dwelled in the country tended to bury their dead in a field on their estates, while city dwellers buried their dead outside the city. And so the main roads leading out of Athens were lined on either side with tombs, much in the same way that advertising billboards clutter the sides of our highways today. The most frequent at roads provided the most favorable burial spots for wealthy families, and it just so happened that the Karamikos, due to its location, was one of the more frequent at roads into and out of Athens, and thus was one of the more popular burial spots. The word Karamikos was said to have come from Karamos, a son of Ariadne and Dionysus, who was sacred to potters. That was one popular folk etymology, but the word Karamos also meant pottery clay in ancient Greek, and the potter's quarter was located there because of the abundance of clay mud carried over by the Ariadnus River. This area was used as a cemetery since the early Bronze Age, but it became big beginning with the geometric period, as we discussed in episode 9. Numerous box-like graves and burial offerings from the period have been discovered by archaeologists, and houses were constructed on the higher, drier ground to the south. During the Archaic period, increasingly large and complex grave mounds, tombs, and monuments were built along the south bank of the Ariadnos, lining the Hirahodos, or Sacred Way, which was the road that led in and out of Athens up to the Acropolis. By the end of the 6th century BC, though, there was a movement towards more simple burials, in which vases holding the deceased's cremated remains were more prevalent. Following the Persian sack of Athens in 480 BC, there was a fundamental change in the appearance of the Karamikos. In 478 BC, thanks to Themistocles' suggestion, which we discussed in episode 40, the Athenians decided that it was prudent to fortify and build a wall around their growing city in case of another Persian attack, and they did so through part of the Karamikos. As a result, many houses sprung up inside the walls shortly thereafter, turning part of it into a residential district. The Karamikos was now divided into an inner and outer, with the former being the potter's quarter in the residential area and the latter covering the cemetery. All of the funerary sculptures were built into the city wall, and two large city gates facing northwest were also built into this wall. The sacred gate, on the southern side, which connected the sacred way with the road that led to the Deme of Eleusis, and the Dipolon gate, 
literally the double gate, which was the main entrance into Athens on the northern side that connected the Dromos to the spot which in due time would become Plato's Academy. The Dipylon Gate was the largest gateway in the ancient world, with its four tall towers at the corners, creating a large rectangular courtyard. It also functioned as the official meeting place for the Athenians when there were funerary ceremonies. During the classical period, an important public building, called the Pompeion, also stood inside the walls in the area between the two gates. It's so named because it served a key function in the Pompeii, or procession, in honor of Athena up to the Acropolis during the Panathenaic Festival, as well as other processions that led into the Agora, such as the one during the city Dionysia. The Pompeion consisted of a large courtyard surrounded by columns and banquet rooms, where the nobility of Athens would eat the sacrificial meat for the festival. According to ancient Greek sources, a hecatomb, or a sacrifice of 100 bulls, was carried out for the festival, and the people received the meat in the Karamikos, possibly in the Dipolon courtyard, as the excavators have found heaps of bones in front of the city wall. Outside the walls, though, we have also burials, which is typical for an ancient city for the reasons of hygiene and concepts of pollution. As we discussed, this also gave the ancients the opportunity to erect some very fancy tombs along the major roadways into Athens. The practice of roadside burial may have arisen in response to a ban on burials within the city that seems to have been imposed in the 6th century BC. The ban may have been due partly to fear of the polluting effect of the dead, and partly for the need to conserve as much space as possible for housing at a time of demographic growth. Roadside burial also provided the family of the deceased with an opportunity to advertise their wealth and prestige in a permanent manner, since its location would have attracted considerable attention. For this reason, gravestones invariably faced the passerby, their sculptured adornments often looking down from an imposing height several meters above the ground. Though these grave markers are technically private monuments, in practice they are public ones, because ideally, if you are setting up a fancy grave monument, you would want to select a prime spot for your monument right by the main road, so that many people would walk past and admire it. In terms of excavating and understanding these graves, many are not found in situ because they have been removed or reused, and in particular, that applies in the Karamikos to grave monuments from the Archaic period. Because when the city wall was built by Themistocles, it was put up rather quickly, and essentially the Athenians used any convenient stone lying around. And so we have found older grave monuments actually built into the city wall, and not in their original position. So as you can see, the Karamikos is a very complicated site, with many layers well into the Roman period. An example of this can be seen in the marble fragment of a funerary stella depicting a boxer that is dated to around 540 BC. It was found among the remains of the Themistoclean wall, but now hangs in the Karamikos Archaeological Museum. So it's a much older piece that was used during the wall's construction. The individual's depiction as a boxer is apparent in his broken nose, cauliflower-shaped ear, and the strapped wrist that he holds aloft as these straps were used by the ancient Greeks to secure knuckle guards for boxing competitions. It is considered one of the earliest examples of a highly individualized athletic depiction in ancient Greek sculpture. It utilizes relief carving techniques to characterize a subject long before such degrees of individual characterization were apparent in freestanding sculpture, as we discussed in episode 56. In ancient Greece, there were very few rules in boxing, and it was a particularly brutal sport. Gloves in the modern sense were not typical in the ancient Greek version of the sport. Rather, fighters wore hemantes, or leather thongs, around their wrists and the lower part of their hands to protect them from damage. In Plato's Gorgias, he refers to boxers as folk with the battered ears, referencing their tendency to become disfigured by violence, like the cauliflower ears depicted in the stele. In fact, it was not unusual for a fighter to become seriously injured or even killed. So it wouldn't be shocking if the man who the Stella was dedicated to had died during combat. Most of the evidence about the handling of death in ancient Greece is related to Athens, yet attitudes towards the dead surely varied markedly from one Greek community to another. The Spartans, for example, were far less cautious in their dealings with the dead than the Athenians were. Legislation attributed to the semi-mythical lawgiver Lycurgus, 
as told by Plutarch, attempted to reduce Spartan fears associated with death by permitting burial within the precincts of the city and even in proximity to sacred places. Still, though, the treatment of death and the dead divides us quite sharply from the mentality of the Greeks collectively. In the modern industrialized world, most people die in hospitals, and very few people would have had any physical contact with a corpse. In the Greek world, though, where death was prevalent amongst persons of all age groups, whether as a result of warfare, accident, or illness, or in the case of women, as a consequence of giving birth, it was incorporated into the life of the community to the degree that would strike many people today as altogether morbid. Different cultures permit different degrees of contact with their dead. Some accept the physical aspect of death as a natural and intimate fact of life. Others are deeply troubled by the idea of a dead body and regard it as something to avoid. Greek culture exhibits both tendencies, permitting proximity to the corpse by family members, but exercising vigilance in preventing pollution from escaping into the community. Given the much lower life expectancy in antiquity, anyone who survived into adulthood would almost certainly have experienced the deaths of several family members and friends, and given that Greek communities were far more closely knit than ours are today, they would have been much more aware of the death of a neighbor, an acquaintance, or a distant relative than is the case in our society. As we mentioned, because there were no hospitals in ancient Greece, most people died either at home or on the battlefield. For deaths in the home, they would have been surrounded by their relatives, even including young children. Of course, there weren't any physicians on hand to prescribe them painkillers. A physician might have treated someone in the earliest stages of an illness, but once it became inevitable that there could be only one outcome, the medical profession had nothing to offer any longer. It's also extremely unlikely that a physician would have been called to put the dying out of their misery by something akin to euthanasia. The one god who may have taken some slight interest in the fate of the dying was the healing god Asclepius. When Socrates passed from this world to the next, in Plato's dialogue, the Crito, he said, referring to a sacrifice, quote, I owe a rooster to Asclepius. See that it gets paid, end quote. Socrates' words may indicate that Asclepius may have eased his passing, or at least he perceived him to have done so. Though it's possible, too, that he's suggesting philosophically that death is a cure for life. A dying person might prepare for their passing by arranging future care for the children, praying, and assembling family members for a final farewell. Many funerary stelae show the deceased, usually sitting, but sometimes standing, and clasping the hand of a standing survivor, often the spouse. When a third onlooker is present, the figure may be their adult child. In Sophocles' Oedipus at Colonus, Oedipus realizes that the appointed time has come for him to die. He prepares for death, asking his daughters to perform the rituals that precede a funeral, as described by the play's messenger. Quote, Oedipus sat down, then he loosened his filthy garments. Next, he called his children and commanded them to bring fresh water, both for washing and for offerings. The two of them went over to the hill of Green Demeter, which was in our view, and in a short time fetched their father what he ordered and attended him with washing and the customary clothes, end quote. Unlike many modern cultures, which encouraged the appearance of a stiff upper lip in the face of loss, Greek culture not only tolerated, but also expected highly demonstrative manifestations of grief. In fact, there are frequent references in literature to men and women tearing at their hair, ripping their garments, beating and clawing their breasts with their nails, rolling on the ground and wallowing in the dust, and going without food or drink for several days. This kind of behavior was prompted in part by a desire to honor the deceased, who were believed to take pleasure in witnessing these exaggerated displays of grief that their death occasioned, as it meant that they were respected and would be missed. In addition, in the Iliad, Book 23, Homer states that when the Greeks were cremating the body of Patrocles, not everyone was grieving for the deceased. Some were using his death as a pretext to bewail their own private losses and griefs. To a Greek, there was nothing hypocritical or insincere in such transference. The loss of a loved one is common to all a human experience, and Greek mourners brought to the funeral their own personal sense of life's pain. In the modern world, 
Among people of most faiths, the death of a loved one is an occasion to seek the consolation of religion, irrespective of the extent of their commitment to it at other times of their lives. The Greeks, by contrast, knew better than to approach their gods in the hope that they could either offer from them some consolation or assist the deceased in their passage to the next world. At the graveside, as in the home, death was a domestic affair. Although the Olympian gods are shown to occasionally mourn the passing of their favorites, as Zeus mourns the death of his son Sarpedon on the battlefield outside Troy and the Iliad, this was the exception rather than the rule. For the most part, they give the impression of being indifferent to the experience of human loss. We might seek to explain their indifference by arguing that their own immortality shielded them from a comprehensive understanding of the finite nature of human life. No less important, though, was the fact that proximity to the dead and dying put the gods severely at risk from the contamination that was caused by death. For example, in Euripides' play Hippolytus, when Artemis' favorite mortal, Hippolytus, dies in agony after having been hurled from his chariot, the goddess swiftly leaves him right before he is about to die, since, as she explains to him, it is not permitted by divine law for a god or a goddess, quote, either to look at the dead or to sully their eyes with the expirations of the dying, end quote. For the same reason, no priest or priestess for a god or goddess was permitted to enter the house of the deceased or to attend a burial. Just as the gods need to preserve their purity, so too did those who ministered to their needs. Which of course contrasts quite starkly with the last rites, for example, that are performed by Catholic priests. Immediately after someone died, the women in the family began to wail with such strong emotion that everyone in the neighborhood would be able to hear. Evidently, this type of emotional outpour would be easily understood that there has been a death in the family and for everyone to stay clear of the home. Because a dead body constituted a strong source of pollution, relatives were required to take elaborate precautions to prevent its contagiousness from seeping out into the community at large. And so, such was the degree of public concern that many city-states passed detailed laws to ensure that the polluting effect of a corpse did not extend beyond the members of the immediate family. For this reason, too, Solon allowed only close family members and women over the age of 60 to enter the house of the deceased and take part in the funerary arrangements. The implemented legal measures that seem to have been intended to combat the polluting effect of the dead include the placing of a bowl of lustral water outside the house so that visitors could purify themselves upon entering and leaving, the hanging of a cypress branch on the door, a custom that may have served to warn passers-by of the presence of a corpse within, the placing of oil flasks, known as lekathoi, containing olive oil, around the couch on which the dead was laid out, and most important of all, the bathing of the corpse. Once the dead had been transported to the place of internment, the house was ritually cleaned. Inscriptions from throughout the Greek world also indicate that it was customary for relatives of the deceased to be debarred from participating in community life for up to several weeks after the funeral, in fear that they would pollute whoever they came into contact with. Perhaps no ritual in ancient Greece was treated with more importance than that of a burial. A popular view quoted by Plato in his treatise titled Hippias Major was that the best thing of all for everyone was, quote, to be rich, healthy, honored by one's fellows, reach old age, and after burying one's parents well, to be laid out well by one's own children and be buried in magnificent style, end quote. The need for a burial is the crux of Sophocles' Antigone, which we discussed in episode 51. When King Creon forbade the burial of his nephew Polynices because he had made war on his native city, Polynices' sister, Antigone, performed burial rites for him. Brought before Creon, she declares that the laws of the gods transcend those of mortals. That's because for the Greeks, a body that hasn't been buried properly could not cross the river Styx and enter into the realm of Hades. The Greek funeral, like our own, was a multi-act drama. On the first day, the body was prepared. On the second day, it was laid out in the home, a process called prothesis. And on the third day, took place a funeral procession from the home to the place of burial, called ekphora. And finally, the burial. 
The prothesis, which literally means the laying out of the body, was performed entirely by the women of the family of the deceased, as they were the ones who took charge of preparing the body for burial. At the moment of death, the deceased's eyes and mouth were closed. A kind of chin strap was commonly tied around the head and chin to prevent the unsightly sagging of the jaw. The body was washed, anointed in olive oil, clothed, and wrapped in white garments, leaving only the head exposed. Finally, the body was laid out on a couch, called a bier, with its head propped up on a pillow and its feet facing the door. This last practice, which seems to be nearly universal, has given rise to the expression about carrying someone out feet first. From the 4th century BC onwards, there developed a tendency to dress the dead more ornately, sometimes even to place a crown made of gold foil atop the head. Whereas in earlier times, a simple wreath of ivy, laurel, or olive sufficed. When the body had been laid out, relatives were permitted to view the deceased. The women relatives were wrapped in dark robes and stood around the bier to enact the ritual mourning. The chief mourner, either the mother or the wife, was positioned at the head, with the others behind her. The women led the mourning by uttering dirges, or cries of lamentation, tearing at their hair and clothing, scarring their cheeks with their nails, and striking their torso, particularly their breasts. In addition, it was acceptable and customary for the mourners to fondle and kiss the corpse. The prothesis may have previously been an outdoor ceremony, but a law that was later passed by Solon decreed that the ceremony had to take place indoors. Before dawn on the day of the funeral, the mourners accompanied the corpse to the place of burial, which as we discussed was typically outside the city walls, since corpses were regarded as sources of pollution. In Athens, according to law, this had to take place within three days of the death, though in hotter weather, especially during the summertime, it may have been done much sooner. The funeral procession, called ekphora, literally the carrying out of the body, saw the body being carried to its final resting place. Solon regulated that it had to take place before sunrise in order to avoid unseemly displays of grief that could cause a public nuisance and draw too much attention to the family. Some corpses were laid out in a simple wooden coffin, but because of the scarcity of wood, the poor had to make do with only a winding sheet, strewn with a few branches. The corpse, whether it was in a coffin or not, was either carried aloft by pallbearers or transported in a cart to the grave. Professional undertakers also could be employed to carry the corpse, as well as to break up the ground for burial. They were known as klimakophoroi, literally ladder men, because in order to transport them, they laid the bodies out on a ladder, which they carried horizontally. We know little about the details of the actual burial service, though. As we mentioned, priests would have been barred from attending for fear that they might incur pollution and possibly transmit it to the gods. And so the burial itself was performed by the relatives of the deceased. Offerings were made to the deceased by only two people, a relative and a lover, the koe, or libation, and the hamakoria, or blood propitiation, were two types of offerings that could have been given. The mourner first dedicated a lock of hair, along with libations of honey, milk, water, wine, perfumes, and olive oil, mixed in varying amounts. A prayer then followed these libations. Then came the enagasmata, which were offerings to the dead that included milk, honey, water, wine, celery, pelanon, which was a mixture of meal, honey, and olive, and koliba, or the first fruits of the crops that were dried out. Although both inhumation and cremation were practiced, with differing degrees of popularity at different times, cremation was more costly as it was regarded as the more prestigious, since this is how the dead were deposed of in the Homeric poems. There is no clear evidence, though, that the use of either reflected different beliefs. If the body was cremated, after the fire died down, the ashes were gathered and placed in an urn, which was then buried, along with grave gifts. Once the grave had been filled in, a grave marker was erected by the relatives. Upon completion of the burial ritual, the mourners returned to the house of the deceased for a commemorative meal called the Peridipnon. The dead man was perceived to be a symbolic host, and his funeral feast was a sign of gratitude towards those who took part in burying him. 
Afterwards, the house and household objects were thoroughly cleansed with seawater and hyssop, a small minty plant whose twigs were used in purification rituals in many ancient Mediterranean religions. And the women most closely related to the dead, who were the mourners, had to ritually wash in clean water. Being a dead Greek meant that you were seen as being part of a continuing family. The so-called handshake motif, which frequently appears on gravestones, symbolizes this fact perfectly. The two people depicted may be parting from this life or greeting each other in the life to come. We can't tell which, and in fact it hardly matters. What the motif demonstrates, though, is the strong Greek belief in human fellowship that outlasts death and is eternal. This attitude had much to do with the belief that in the period between death and burial, the deceased are in need of the mindful attention of their relatives. That's because the Greeks treated death as a rite of passage, established to help the dead negotiate the transition from the state of being, at the point of death, to actually being integrated into Hades, the world of the dead. Until inhumation or cremation has taken place, the dead were thought to be in what anthropologists describe as a liminal stage, a word that derives from the Latin lemon or threshold. They were between two worlds, having not yet fully disengaged from this one, while awaiting incorporation into the next. Entry into Hades did not occur automatically, though, but was the consequence of strenuous activity on the part of the living. This in-between status was regarded as extremely perilous, for which reason the unburied dead were believed to be at considerable risk. The primary obligation upon the living was thus to perform the burial as expeditiously and efficiently as possible. To fail in this sacred duty was to condemn the dead to wander up and down the banks of the river Styx, which surrounded Hades, for thousands of years. For example, in Book 23 of the Iliad, When Achilles delays burying Patrocles' corpse because of his overwhelming grief, Patrocles' ghost appears to Achilles and urgently requests that he bury him as soon as possible so that he can enter the gates of Hades. In fact, the mouth of the deceased was sometimes sealed with a token or talisman, referred to as Karan's obol if a coin was used, and explained as payment for the ferryman of the dead to transport the soul from the world of the living to the world of the dead. Initiates into mystery religions might be furnished with a gold tablet, sometimes placed on the lips or otherwise positioned with the buried body, that offered instructions for the deceased in how to navigate the afterlife and address the rulers of the underworld, Hades and Persephone. The German term, Totenpass, or a passport for the dead, is sometimes used in modern scholarship for these. We will discuss this in more detail in the next few episodes. And so, bereaved relatives continued to maintain a close attachment to the deceased long after death had occurred, because their welfare in Hades was thought to depend on the attention that they received from the living. This sense of connectedness between the living and the dead was further conveyed by the fact that the female relatives of the deceased were expected to pay regular visits to the grave, particularly on the anniversary of the day of death, but also at other intervals throughout the year, in order to deposit food and drink on or beside their funerary monuments. We gain an insight into the importance of such rituals from the speaker of a speech written by Isaias, titled On the Estate of Menecles, who declares mournfully that if his opponent prevails, quote, there will be no one to perform the sacred ancestral rites on behalf of the deceased, nor to offer the annual sacrifice to him either, but he will be deprived of the honors due to him, end quote. Evidently, the speaker counted on the jury to be outraged by such a prospect. Because the dead were believed either to dwell in the proximity of their grave, or at least to be capable of visiting it periodically, a variety of gifts judged necessary for their physical welfare were buried with their corpses and deposited periodically afterwards beside the tomb. In the archaic period, Aristocratic youths who died at the height of their physical powers were commemorated by statues of naked standing youths known as kuroi, which we discussed in great detail in episode 17. The most common grave gift in 5th century BC Athens, though, was the oil flask, or lekathos, which was decorated with images relating to the care of the dead, set against a white background. 
the Greeks marked the tombs of those who died before or during marriageable age with a stone marker in the form of a lekathos, which would have contained the lustral water that a bride bathed in before her wedding. Other common objects that were deposited at the tomb include branches of myrtle, wreaths, and cakes. It was also customary to anoint gravestones with olive oil and wood-colored sashes around their shafts, almost as if gravestones, in some sense, embodied or ensouled the dead. By the classical period, though, funerary laws dictated limits for expense and luxury on tombs in which women could mourn and how much they mourn as mourners had to be first cousins of, or even more directly related to, the deceased. A practical consequence of such legislation is that a woman's opportunity for gathering and for expressing herself was restricted. However, women also had a role in influencing funerary arrangements, with the speaker in Isaias' speech, titled On the Estate of Chiron, explaining that he acquiesced to his grandmother's wishes for how his grandfather would be buried. This responsibility continued long after the funeral, and women regularly left their homes in order to visit the graves of their family members. And many images of Lekathoi show women bringing offerings to a grave. A tomb was customarily visited on the 3rd, 9th, and 30th day and a year after the funeral. This was an important responsibility because anyone who neglected to do the customary rituals at the tombs of their ancestors could be prosecuted, as seen in Demosthenes. Of course, it was the family's curios who would be prosecuted and not the women. During the archaic and classical periods, the Athenians used both inhumation, meaning burial, and cremation. Burial could have been done in a variety of receptacles, depending on one's wealth. Typically, burial pits were a simple hole in the ground or perhaps one lined with slabs of stone or tiles. But sometimes sarcophagi made of stone were used for the more wealthy. There were two types of cremation, what is referred to as primary and secondary. Primary is where the place of deposition is the same as the place of incineration. In other words, the location of the funeral pyre is also where the remains will stay and become the grave site. Secondary cremation, which is what the Athenians tended to do during this period, and of course which is what we practice usually today, is where the place of deposition is different from the place of incineration. In other words, after the body has been burned, the ashes would be gathered up and deposited somewhere else, usually in a vase. Another important burial type to note is what is called enkertrismos, which is an inhumation method that usually applies to small children by burying them in a reused storage vessel, sometime like a large amphora that has been used to transport oil or wine. Often the child is simply stuffed into the pot, and so it isn't broken up. This is a very common method for burial of small children across the ancient Greek world, because children tended to not be cremated for a number of reasons. Possibly culturally, in that for some it was considered inappropriate, as well as impractical, since it might not be easy to burn a small child with very little body fat. But as far as the adults, it's not clear to us how they made the choice between inhumation and cremation. Although there are some broad shifts over time, there doesn't seem to be any clear patterns in terms of gender or social status influencing the method of burial. It might have been more to do with personal or familial preference, much as it is today, or even the trends of a particular cemetery might have held influence too. Burials typically held one occupant. On the whole, we don't get many multiple or mass burials during this period, though there are some important exceptions. Those can be attributed to war and epidemics, such as the plague during the Peloponnesian War, described by Thucydides in Book 2. One of the things that he makes a big point about is how normal burial customs just fell apart in the context of this epidemic that was killing so many people. He says, quote, All the funeral ceremonies which used to be observed were now disorganized, and they buried the dead as best they could. Many people adopted the most shameless methods. They would arrive first at a funeral pyre, which had been made by others, put their own dead upon it and set it alight, or finding another pyre burning, they would throw the corpse that they were carrying on top of the other one and go away. End quote. And so to Thucydides, at least, this lack of conducting proper burial rites was seen as a moral breakdown as much as anything. 
In addition, during the construction of the Karamikos metro station in the mid-1990s, during the expansion of Athens' underground railway system, a very important mass grave was found, containing over a thousand graves and including a very large circular shaft with around 90 skeletons, including about 10 children, all thrown into the pit in a very random way with no soil separating them. It is believed that the pit dates to the second half of the 5th century BC, thanks to some very cheap vases that were placed along with them during burial. So it looks like we have here a very hasty mass burial that is datable to the time of the plague that Thucydides is describing. There was also an important communal area for burial in Athens, known as the Demosion Sema literally the public burial ground. It was located at the beginning of the Dromos, which was the ancient road leading from the Dipolon Gate to Plato's Academy. At the Demosion Sema, the Athenians congregated to honor their dead with ceremonies, games, and funerary speeches. More on that shortly. Thucydides wrote, quote, The coffins are laid in the Demosion Sema, which is situated in the most beautiful suburb of the city. There, they always bury those fallen in war, except indeed those who fell at Marathon. For their valor, the Athenians judged to be preeminent, and they buried them on the spot where they fell. With the exception of Marathon, the Athenians were unlike most of the other Greeks, in that if there was a big battle, they didn't bury their dead on the battlefield, and instead brought them home, and they would have been buried in the Demos Sion Sima. This is something also mentioned in the law court speech of Demosthenes, titled Against Leptines when he described how great the Athenian state is. Quote, See what strong evidence we have of this? In the first place, you alone of all mankind publicly pronounce over your dead funeral orations, in which you extol the deeds of the brave. Such, however, is the practice of men who admire bravery, not of men who envy the honors that bravery wins. Next, you have from time immemorial given the richest rewards to those who win crowns in the athletic games. No one, I think, has ever surpassed our state in generosity. Such a superabundance of rewards has she heaped on those who serve her well. End quote. Demosthenes here is referring to public orations over the dead. A funeral oration, or Epitathios Logos, was a formal speech delivered on the ceremonial occasion of a funeral. In ancient Greece, and in particular in Athens, the funeral oration was deemed an indispensable component of the funeral ritual. In fact, it was regarded by the ancients as an almost exclusive Athenian creation, although some early elements of such speeches exist in the epic poems of Homer and in the lyric poems of Pindar. For example, in Homer's Iliad, at the funeral of his dear friend, Achilles laid his blood-stained hand on the breast of Patrocles and cried, quote, Farewell, Patrocles. Even in the house of Hades, I will do all that I promised you. I will drag Hector there, and let dogs devour him raw. Twelve noble sons of Trojans will I also slay before your pyre, to avenge you. End quote. Still, though, the Athenians are those who set the standard, and therefore, Demosthenes praises them, saying once again that, quote, You alone of all mankind publicly pronounce over your dead funeral orations in which you extol the deeds of the brave. The orator Anaximenes of Lampsacus claimed that the Athenian funeral oration originated in the 6th century BC by Solon, but this is widely doubted by historians. Most plausible, but not beyond doubt, is the statement by Dionysus of Halicarnassus that the Athenians instituted the funeral oration, quote, In honor of those who fought at Artemisium, Salamis, and Plataea, and died for their country, or to the glory of their exploits at Marathon. Historians now believe that the Demosion Sema and the Epitathios Logos were first established around 470 BC and were customs that expanded during the Periclean period. The earliest preserved casualty list, giving the names of those who died fighting for their city in a given year, dates to 490 BC, and it is associated with the Battle of Marathon. In white ground lekathoi depicting funerary scenes started around 470 BC. Pericles' funeral oration, as reported by Thucydides, is the earliest epitathios logos presented in full. And so the burial of the war dead in the first year of the Peloponnesian War is regarded as reflecting the 5th century BC dominance of the public co-memorial, which by the late 430s BC was firmly established. 
Though Plato is consistently suspicious of the ability of oratory to teach, in the Men Exynos, he demonstrates a theoretical interest in funeral oratory. He actually describes the scheme of the traditional Athenian funeral oration with the following succinct phrase, quote, And the speech required is one which will adequately eulogize the dead and give kindly exhortation to the living, appealing to their children and their brethren to copy the virtues of these heroes, and to their fathers and mothers and any still surviving ancestors offering consolation, end quote. And so according to Plato, the traditional Epitaphios Logos must contain a eulogy of the war dead and the city, an exhortation to the relatives to copy the virtues of the war dead, and a consolation for the living members of their families. Therefore, the Epitaphios Logos consists of the following parts. A preamble, which treats the performance expectations of the audience by usually asserting that it is almost impossible for him to find words worthy of the glorious achievements of the war dead. The city's origin and ancestors, the war dead, their self-sacrifice and their devotion to the Athenian polity, and an epilogue, which provides comfort and encouragement to the families of the war dead and employs a traditional dismissal of the mourners for further private lament at which point the city's promise of education for the surviving orphans signals the resumption of life in the polis. The primary function of the funeral oration was to give public expression to the conception of the potential excellence of the polis. It was an occasion on which Athens invented and reinvented itself in narrative form. The city displayed its achievements, as well as the civic and personal virtues to which its younger citizens could aspire. By celebrating the ideal of the democratic Athenian city, the city can recognize itself as it wishes to be. We also get a description of the Demosion Sema by Pausanias in the 2nd century AD, who claims to be looking at the tombs of the most prominent Athenian men from the 5th and 4th centuries BC. He wrote, quote, Thrasybolus's tomb is here, and beside it the tombs of Pericles, Cabrias, and Formion. There is a memorial to all the Athenians who died in battles at sea or on land, except for those who fought at Marathon. Their tomb is in that place, in honor of their courage, but all the rest lie beside the road to the academy, referring to the Demosion Sema. Tombstones stand on each grave to tell you each man's name and district. The tomb of Cleisthenes, those lie here who fell at Corinth in 394 BC, Harmodius and Aristogiton, the Tyrannicides, and Ephialtes. End quote. This is unlikely to be an accurate description because this part of Athens was trashed by several attacks on the city, including by Philip V of Macedon in 200 BC and the Roman general Sola in 86 BC, well before Pausanias makes his visit. So it is unclear exactly how much he was able to see and exactly what sort of a state of preservation it was in. It is possible that he is still using some earlier description of the area, but we just don't know. Nevertheless, it's still evident that the type of people who were buried here were statesmen, orators, generals, war dead, and those who served the state in some way. For a while, we weren't entirely sure on its exact location, but again, in the 1990s, archaeologists managed to work out four large rectangular structures that were damaged during the Roman period, but in them were found burned bones of skeletons that have been identified as male. There were more than one in each structure, signifying multiple burials. They were accompanied by pottery dating to the 5th century BC. So given all of this, and its location on the way to Plato's academy, archaeologists believe the so-called polyandria, literally meaning lots of men, were part of the Demosion Sema. Interestingly, one of these were divided into two. One of the things that Thucydides also points out is that burial was done according to the tribe you belong to. So this division in the burial might be reflecting that tribal division. The point of all of this evidence is that what we get emphasized here are collective identities. Everyone here gets the same type of burial in the same type of place. That means that the other social factors that are often emphasized, particularly during the Archaic period, like wealth and aristocratic lineage, were suppressed at this point in favor of service towards the state. Again, this is something we see in Pericles' funeral oration at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, which was delivered in the Demosion Sema. Pericles says, as recorded by Thucydides, quote, No one, so long as he has it in him to be of service to the state, is kept in political obscurity because of poverty, 
we regard wealth as something to be properly used, rather than as something to boast about. As for poverty, no one need to be ashamed to admit it. The real shame is in not taking practical measures to escape from it. End quote. So there are ideas that ostentatious display of wealth can be problematic in democratic Athens. Having talked about the location of graves, now we need to discuss the issue of grave markers in Athens. The way one actually marked a grave is a very important issue and where we can really see divisions in Athenian society and ideas of identity fluctuating over time, though not necessarily a fluctuation in social distinctions, but one in how they were displayed. Why it was okay at some points and not at others tells us a lot about what's going on socially in Athens. For example, one very important category for evidence for women of the classical period were grave stelae that towards the end of the 5th century BC started to show them taking part in family scenes, which was a change from the grave markers from the late 6th century BC, where the imagery was rather different. It was almost entirely confined to the sort of thing you see in the stelae of Aristion, that being the young male, elite, aristocratic warrior athlete. We rarely have the actual burial to go along with the grave marker because the two have been separated over time, but it does seem likely that it was essentially elite males and those who died relatively young that qualified for a very flashy grave marker. These sort of grave markers, though, almost stop at the end of the 6th century BC, and what replaces them is much more plainer. And this might very well be as a result of sumptuary funerary legislation, which we get little hints at in the literary record. For example, the 1st century BC Roman orator Cicero, in his De Legibus, says, quote, Sometime later, meaning after Solon, on account of the size of the tombs which we see in the Karamaikos, it was decreed that no one should make a tomb which required the work of more than ten men in three days, and that no tomb should be decorated with plaster or have the so-called herm set upon it, end quote. This is rather problematic because the chronology is vague, the terminology is a bit old, he uses opus tectorium to refer to plaster, and he also talks about putting herms on tombs, and as far as we know, they were not used as grave monuments, so he might have gotten that wrong. Still, what he seems to be describing is that there was a law against producing large, elaborate monuments that were decorated with sculpture, and there were limitations in the amount of time that could be spent on it, and the sorts of decoration that a grave could have. It's very tempting to associate this passage to the demise of grave monuments towards the end of the 6th century BC, though if you had 10 men working for 3 days, for example, that's still plenty of time to build a very fancy grave monument. It's also tempting to make another link to ask ourselves how far this type of thing was related to the reforms of Cleisthenes and the rise of democracy in Athens. This is something that is much debated by scholars today as well. It is true that we do get some lavish tombstones just after his time, so if there was some legislation, it might have taken some time to fully go into effect. But it's also true that for most of the 5th century BC, Athenian grave markers were quite boring on the whole being mainly plain lumps of stone with a name and possibly some decoration, but nothing too exotic. And the grave goods are fairly basic as well, such as those found in the Marathon Tumulus. Part of the reason for this could be that in addition to whatever sumptuary legislation might have existed, primarily though, it was seen as problematic in a newly democratic Athens for anyone to flaunt their wealth. It was okay to be wealthy as long as it was directed towards the good of the state, for example, in the form of liturgies, as we saw in episode 44. But the flaunting of wealth for private purposes was taboo, and that included having a very flashy private house, which was not the norm, as we saw in episode 73. However, as always with ancient Greece, it's not that simple. One of the problems is that in the 5th century BC, these levels of restraint and burial customs are not confined to just Athens. It is a pan-Hellenic phenomenon, as it's going on all over Greece, in places where there weren't democracies, but other forms of governments. So bigger picture, we have to look at other social conditions. For example, Corinth in the 5th century BC doesn't really differentiate between burials at all. Just about everyone, as far as we can tell, gets a plain stone sarcophagus with a few pots in it, with nothing clearly fancy to demarcate wealth or social status. And Corinth does not have a democracy at this period. Things, though, change again because all of this is highly cyclical, 
Towards the end of the 5th century BC, we start to get highly fancy burials popping up again in Athens, which suggests that if there was legislation or some other ideology which was suppressing fancy burials, it seems to have lost force or support. As a result, we get fancy grave stelae again, such as the stela of Hegeso or the stela of Amphoretti, which we discussed in episode 56. These are all often of high quality and coincide with when the Parthenon was more or less finished, so it could have been that there were many out-of-work sculptors floating around Athens looking for work. But even if that was the case, they wouldn't have found work unless there was a receptive audience and ready-made market of people willing to spend money on it. And so with this, we enter a second period in Athens, from the late 5th and into the 4th centuries BC, where we get a lot of extravagance and competition going on in the funerary arena. Estelli, reliefs and marble monuments were commissioned by the wealthiest Athenian families and medics in order to show off their wealth and perpetuate the memory of their family's achievements. Many of these grave markers appear in the context of the peribolus, which refers to an enclosure wall. In classical Athens, there seems to have been a belief that the family would be able to reunite in the hereafter if its members were buried in the same place. This may explain the popularity of the family lot, a large rectangular space walled on the front and at the sides, to which access could be gained only from the rear. Family plots, which had become popular by the end of the 5th century BC, contained grave monuments commemorating all of the family dead, including household slaves in some cases. Most only had three or four burials in them, maybe two or three generations, and they were very lavish. Although periboloi existed for centuries, it wasn't very common until we get to this period, and it has been estimated that there were over 130 periboloi arrangements around Athens, of which only a handful date to before the late 5th century BC. We also have a lot of funerary inscriptions from rather plainer tombs that suggest that while most people of Athens might have had some sort of a plain grave marker, there was a small proportion who were spending a lot of money on these kinds of things, and they were not adhering to any earlier tradition on restraint. Many of these periboloi would have been seen on the so-called street of tombs in the Karamikos, which was a branch of the sacred way that led to the long walls in the Piraeus that contains the best preserved and the most luxurious funerary monuments of the 5th and 4th centuries BC. The high wall there that displays these grave monuments is heavily restored though. The ones on site currently, including the famous image of a large bull and the grave stela of Hegeso, are all replicas and the originals are in the Karamikos Museum and elsewhere. We also have found periboloi in other parts of Attica, particularly from the Piraeus and Ramnus, both on the coast and the latter being in the northeast near Marathon. These periboloi weren't just for Athenian citizens either. For example, the Peribolus of Agathon and Sosocrates, who are from Heraclea in the Pontus, indicate that medics had commissioned these type of grave markers too, entering themselves into this Athenian idea of elite display of ostentation. And so, expenditure on the dead came very high on the list of the wealthy's financial priorities. For instance, in Lysias' law court speech, titled Against Diogaiton, we hear of one family tomb erected in the final decade of the 5th century BC that cost at least 2,500 drachmas, although the defendant actually claims that the true figure for the tomb of his brother, Diodotus, was twice that amount. This was at a time when a rower in Athens' navy earned nearly one drachma per day. Basically, he spent five to seven years' worth of salary for an average person on a single tomb. So regardless, this was clearly a lot of money. Although it's detailed within the context of a legal prosecution, and the figures could obviously be exaggerated, there doesn't seem to be an indication that this was an unreasonable amount in the law court speech itself. Plato, though, in his idealized society, believed that there ought to be a restriction on graves. He writes in his laws, quote, They shall not pile up a mound to a height greater than can be made by five men in five days, nor shall they erect stone pillars of a size more than is required to hold, at the most, a eulogy of the dead man's life consisting of not more than four heroic lines. One ought never to spend extravagantly on the dead. It is our duty to make a wise use of what we have and to spend in moderation. Let this then be the law, an expedienture on the whole funeral, not exceeding five minas for a man of the highest property class, three minas for one of the second class, two for one of the third, and one mina for one of the fourth class, shall be held to moderate amounts. End quote. 
A couple of interesting things to note is that for Plato, the amount one can spend is related to their social class. And secondly, although he proposes a limit, five minas is still an enormous amount of money, so he isn't really limiting it that much. We also have other evidence of graves. In the Karamikos, in the section marked as H, a bronze urn was found with cremated remains in it. Found near it was an inscription that said, Hipparete, daughter of Alcibiades, from Scambonidae, which has led some people to think that Alcibiades' remains were actually in this urn. We don't know for sure, but a bronze urn is a very expensive receptacle for ashes, conjuring up heroic burials of Patrocles and Hector in the Iliad. So some scholars like to make links there, because as we will surely cover in the future, Alcibiades was a very ostentatious person. So while there were public burials taking place in the Democeon Sema, there were ostentatious private monuments alongside them. One of the most famous examples where we see the two of these intertwined is the grave stella of Dexileos, who died in 394-393 BC in the battle against Corinth at the Nemea River, an event we will definitely discuss in the future. On the inscription it says, quote, Dexileus, son of Lysanias and Thoricos, born in the archonship of Tysander, which is 414-413 BC, one of the five knights who fell at Corinth in the archonship of Eubolides, which is 394-393 BC, end quote. His brother and sister were also in the same plot, and a nephew was also nearby. So his grave monument was set up in one of these periboloi. However, he died in a battle, which means he wasn't buried under this particular monument in the Karamikos, but along with everyone else in the demo Sion Sema. And we know this because we have the list of the dead from the battle, and Pausanias also saw that and recorded it. And we have a second monument, also from the demo Sion Sema, which is something called the Anthemion, or a palmette, floral design monument for the hippies or cavalry. It seems to be a monument set up promoting the importance for the Hippes class. So we have two markers for him in the Demo Sion Sema. Dexileus is also buried in the Demo Sion Sema. And then we also have this third monument, which is put up in his family's plot in the Street of the Tombs, a replica of which can be seen on site. This is what is known as a cenotaph, or an empty tomb. It's a very fancy grave marker right on the corner where it can be seen. The implication is that his family was not content with the normal fallen citizen burial, where social distinctions weren't made. They wanted to make a clear distinction between their wealth, their family, and everybody else. And so it's a very expensive grave marker for somebody who was actually buried somewhere else. Grave monuments increased in elaboration as the 4th century BC progressed, and it seems though that all of this competition had reached such a pitch that after Athens was under Macedonian control, Demetrius of Thaleron, who was then the governor of Athens, found it necessary to introduce legislation once again, severely limiting their costliness, evidently to curb unnecessary expenditure in a period of economic decline. Cicero in his De Legibus once again informs us, quote, but Demetrius of Phaleron also tells us that pomp at funerals increased again to about the degree which obtains for Rome at present. Demetrius himself limited these practices by law. He lessened extravagance not only by a provision of a penalty for it, but also by a rule in regard to the time of funerals. For he ordered that corpses should be buried before daybreak. But he also placed a limit upon newly erected monuments, providing that nothing should be built above the mound of earth except a small column, no higher than three cubits, 1.5 meters, or a table or a basin. And he created a magistrate to oversee this legislation, end quote. And so moving forward, the most common form of gray marker was a simple marble column known as a kioniskos which were about two to three feet in height above the ground and a foot or so in diameter, as well as these little table-shaped markers in which the kioniscus were placed, known as trapezi. A bunch of these kioniscoi and trapezi can still be seen, not in situ, but they have been collected and put in one place outside the Karamikos Museum. You might be able to make out the inscriptions on some of the kioniscoi, detailing the deceased's name, his father's name, and his deem. They are very simple, and it's once again implementing a leveling ideology, as it's not possible to distinguish social differences between these individuals. It's not that everyone was equal, as there were still rich and poor people, but these were suppressed at death, and the funeral arena was no longer one where you could compete socially, 
the great age of honoring the dead with sumptuous monuments was now over. Just to complete the story, as we alluded to earlier, many of the buildings in the vicinity of the Karamaikos were razed to the ground by the marauding army of the Roman dictator Sulla during his sacking of Athens in 86 BC, an episode that Plutarch described as a bloodbath. During the 2nd century AD, a storehouse was constructed on the site of the Pompeian, where many monuments were kept, but it was destroyed during the invasion of the Heruli in 267 AD. The ruins became the site of potter's workshops until about 500 AD, when two parallel colonnades were built behind the city gates, overrunning the old city walls. A new festival gate was constructed to the east, with three entrances leading into the city. This was in turn destroyed in raids by the invading Avars and Slavs at the end of the 6th century, and the Karamikos fell into obscurity. It was not rediscovered until a Greek worker dug up a stele in 1863. On the next episode, we will continue the theme of death by looking at the last major Chthonic deity that has yet to be discussed, and the various domains that she had her hands in, including magic, sorcery, witchcraft, knowledge of herbs and poisonous plants, crossroads, entranceways, ghosts, and necromancy. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 80, Hecate and Magic. (laughs) 